who goes through the tribulation and why? I mean, is God just wanting to harm the earth? I mean, why is he, why is this so planned? In fact, this period of time, the tribulation through the millennium, is 20 some percent of the Bible. So it's, I mean, of the whole Bible. Of the 1,189 chapters, one-fifth of them are about all this. So why? Uh, and, and who is he planning to go through? And then, uh, the seven-year tribulation, who goes through it and why? And, and start with me in the book of Jeremiah. And, and I want to show you something. You actually need, uh, if you can, uh, open to Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is one of those great books of the Bible. Uh, when, you, when you get to uh, Hebrew class, you find out that there are more Hebrew words in the book of Jeremiah uh, than in any other book of the Bible. This, this is the, the big book as far as uh, in total number of words. But look at Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. That's where we're going to start. Uh, who goes through the tribulation and why? Number one, Israel. Why? Because it's the time of what the Bible calls Jacob's trouble. And, and you, you might, and, and I want to show you the, per, the principle of the greater context. You say, Jeremiah 30, this verse pulled out, just stuck on the board, says, for that day is great, we're not sure what day that is, so that none is like it, and we're not sure the context of that, and it's the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. What is this talking about? Is this talking about the patriarch, Jacob? Is he uh, being troubled by the Amorites of the hill country of, 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 you know, the promised land. What is going on? And so if you look in your Bibles, the, you know, it's talking much about something about Israel. And verse 10 of the same chapter says, don't, be, don't fear, don't be dismayed, I will save you, um, and, and all of that. But when you get across to the next chapter, you see the wider context. Remember I told you that one-fifth of the Bible, this is a very large section talking about, remember who Jeremiah is, the weeping prophet, the prophet, prophet that presided over the decline and fall and destruction and captivity of Jerusalem. He served four decades and didn't have one response. Imagine someone as well known as Billy Graham preaching continu continuously for four decades and not one person ever walked forward. That's Jeremiah's life. But look what he, in, in his primary ministry, uh, ongoing was this writing ministry. Look at chapter 31, and, and I'll start in verse 3. The Lord has appeared of old to me and said, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. That is a beautiful verse. Many people claim it. It's highlighted and underlined in their Bible, but look at the next one. Again, I will build you, and you shall be rebuilt, O virgin daughter of Israel. Something is going on that has to do with Israel. Look at verse 8. Behold, I will bring them from the north country. Bring who? Israel. From where? The north country. The context of this verse is chapter 31. And chapter 31 says God is going to be doing something with Israel. He's going to bring them from the north country. Verse 8 continues, and gather them from the ends of the earth. And verse 9, they'll come with weeping and with supplication. Do you know what's fascinating? Jeremiah was presiding over the prophetic office of Israel as Nebuchadnezzar destroys Jerusalem. And the 2,600 years of what's called by Jesus the times of the Gentiles began. Israel lost their sovereignty. They lost their nationhood. They lost having a king ruling over them. They lost being independent among the nations. And they began to be trampled, and they were actually dispersed. First, they were dispersed, you know, by the Assyrians, and the Babylonians spread them around, but they stayed primarily in, in the Egypt to Iraq, Iran area. But then when Rome came, Rome sent them, remember the four we looked at this morning, the four, Babylon was the first, Rome's the last. Rome sent them to the far ends of the earth. And look at this. This is a future time. It says, behold, I will bring them, that's Israel, from the north country and gather them from the ends of the earth. Did you know today Israel, now since 1948, it's become a nation. They now have citizens of Israel from 100 different countries of the world. I don't know if we have that in America. We're the melting pot. 
Israel is the ultimate. They have Israelis from 100 countries around the world. 100 different cultures and languages are reflected within Israel. And it's interesting, the majority, more than half of the nation of Israel today alive in Israel, more than half of them are from verse 8, the north country. They're Russians. Isn't that interesting? Half of Israel are from Russia. Now, that's an amazing coincidence, or it is God's word writing history in advance, telling us about what's going to happen at the end of days. So you can decide. And they come with weeping. Verse 9, you can watch the documentaries. When they come on, on this aliyah, when they return to the land, those people, when they come down the, the steps of the airplane or wherever they're getting off, they drop down and they kiss the ground and cry. They can't believe that they made it back to their land. Verse 10, Hear the word of the Lord, O nation, declare it the isles afar off. He who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him like a shepherd does his flock. And on and on, and, and you can read, and Jeremiah is filled with that. So the time of Jacob's trouble is fulfilling, and if you just want to read more, Romans 9 through 11, Paul is talking about God's sovereign election of Israel. And uh, if you at all believe in God's sovereignty or in his election, you know that he doesn't change his mind. And he sovereignly elected Israel, the nation, the ethnic descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Romans 9 through 11 tells us that God is going to bring them back until they believe, but they don't get a free ride. They're going to go through the most horrible time that you heard about this morning where the Antichrist is going to persecute them. Secondly, not only is Israel going through, the whole world. The seven-year tribulation, who goes through it and why? Why is this tribulation? Number one, the, the first and most important thing that God is doing in the tribulation is saving Israel. And you're seeing the stirrings right now. It's phenomenal what's going on in Israel. One of my friends is involved in a church planning ministry there, uh, I mean a large church planning ministry, and this ministry is primarily working among the Russian immigrants because the Russians that came to Israel have lived in Russia for so long and heard the gospel so long, and even though they're Jewish, they're not blinded and hard-hearted like so many of the people that have lived generations in Israel, and they are listening to the gospel being preached. And there are right now more messianic congregations. What I'm talking about is people that believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah in Israel than there have been since the time of the apostles. I mean, it is unbelievable what's going on. And, and the, the rabbi, everybody, the head of all the different Hasidic parties in Israel don't know what to do with it because that's the last thing they want is Christianity they call it. And so, so it's for Israel, but the whole world. See what Daniel 7.23 says? Thus he said, the fourth beast is a fourth kingdom on earth, which will be different than all other kingdoms, and it devours the whole earth. So this, this coming uh, final cataclysm is global. Uh, it says, Jesus said this. Look what Jesus says in Luke 21.35. We're going to actually look at, at the end, at the whole 21st chapter. Jesus gives to us what I call the the tribulation survival guide. And it's, it's everything that people in the tribulation need to know. And you know what you find out? It's kind of like when I lived in California. They said, you know what? Someday you might go through an earthquake, but if you don't go through an earthquake and the power's just off for a couple hours, you'll be glad you did this. And you had your little box of everything you needed if there was no power and the grocery stores closed. It was just this little preparation. Jesus kind of gives that to us in Luke 21, and we'll look at that. But look what he says. For it will come as a snare. This is, Luke 21 is parallel to Mark 13 and Matthew 24, that is Jesus talking about prophecy. And these three chapters are the Olivet Discourse. And look what Jesus says right in the middle of him discussing the end of the world. He says it will come, it is the tribulation, it is the end of the world, will come like a snare. Now how, who all is involved in the snare? All those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. So God says everybody, everybody alive and breathing when the tribulation starts is going through this event. And then Revelation 13, 
It was granted to him, again, it's the beast, the Antichrist, to make war with the saints. Now, isn't it interesting um, that, that, that we saw in Daniel 7 the very same thing this morning? He's making war with the saints. Uh, this is with the, the, what we're seeing the beginning of that's going on in Israel right now. This is with the people that are being saved through the two witnesses, 144,000, and the angel that's preaching. This is everybody that's left on earth that, that responds to God. The Antichrist is fighting them and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. He's going to totally control the earth. So, the whole world. 